Sloane Crossley is the author of the best-selling novels Cult Classic and The Clasp and three New York Times best-selling essay collections, Look Alive Out There, I Was Told There'd Be Cake, and How Did You Get This Number? She is a two-time finalist for the Thurber Prize for American Humor and a contributing editor for Vanity Fair. She joins us this evening with her first full-length work of nonfiction, Grief is for People. Please welcome Sloane Crossley back to the Free Library. Hi. Hi, hello. I was very happy for that lovely introduction. Oh, this doesn't move. I guess I'll just, oh, it moves. Um, can you hear me? OK, good. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction and for warning me that there's like a lip up here. So I didn't <laughs> attack the attack the podium. Um, so as you can tell, um, I'm not in conversation with anyone but you guys, <laughs> um, because um, uh, Andy Cahan, who's normally here and wonderful, I'm sure you guys all, uh, some of you know him, uh, is, has a cold, I guess. I sound like Frank Sinatra has a cold. So I'm going to read for a little bit longer than I might normally. Don't worry, it won't be interminable. And then um, answer some questions. Um, and so uh, hopefully that will be a, a good time in its own way. Um, it's been strange going on tour for this book. Uh, and it's, you know, it's funny, but it's about uh, the death of my friend, um, as some of you probably know, because you're here. Um, and it's also about a burglary I experienced. So to give you an overview for those who, who don't know, uh, in 2019, I left my apartment for one hour uh, to get a hand x-ray, which means that I took off all my rings. I know. And <laughs> it's okay, worse things happen to the people. But, um, and then I uh, came home and uh, found uh, the cabinet where I keep all my jewelry was sort of, drawers were smashed on the floor and I, um, realized that I had been robbed. I had been burglarized and was the only one in my apartment building hit. And uh, so that started a, a mystery of where the jewelry went, who took it, um, what happened. Uh, was I being sort of watched? Why was it taken? I don't know if you could tell, but I don't walk around with like tiaras on my head, like let's say like rob me and you know diamonds. Um, and uh, one of the people helping me sort of try to solve this uh, grand mystery uh, was my dear friend and former mentor in the publishing world where I used to work at Random House, um, Russell Perot, uh, who then died by suicide exactly one month after this experience. Um, and so the title uh, is, I guess, the one pre-question I'll answer before I, in case anyone has it, <laughs> before I start reading. Um, there's a line in the book where I say, once after Russell dies, I realize that grief is for people, not things. Which I don't know if I entirely believe, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, but for now, story time. All burglaries are alike, but every burglary is uninsured in its own way. On June 27th, 2019, at 5.15 p.m., I leave my apartment for one hour and come home to find all my jewelry missing. This is the front entrance of the story, the facts of the case. Container first, emotion second. As if by offering up an order of events, the significance of those events will fill itself in automatically. But that story ends before it begins, without ever really being told. The thief enters the story through my bedroom window. He scurries up the corroded metal steps of my fire escape. He lifts the screen and then the glass, crouching to make himself small. Into the stillness of my bedroom come his dirty boots, sinking into the white comforter. To be fair, he has no choice but to step on the comforter. The bed is flush with the window because it takes up half the room. Once inside, the thief takes a total of five minutes and 41 pieces of jewelry. Amid the otherwise unremarkable loot are my grandmother's amber amulet, the size of an apricot, as well as her green cocktail ring, a dome with tears of tourmaline. Think kryptonite, think dish soap. But let us pause here before you get too turned around. My grandmother was an awful person. I've never met anyone who misses her. She was abusive and creative about it. If she was irritated at one of her children, she would instruct the other two to give the offending child the silent treatment. When my mother was a kid, she would be sent to her room with the understanding that my grandmother would be up at any minute with a belt. Sometimes she showed, sometimes she didn't. Sometimes she'd dig her nails into my mother's arm until the skin broke, 
an act of violence exacerbated by the bafflement that followed. Darling, whatever have you done to yourself? By the time this woman and I overlapped in sentience and height, she was cordial enough, hinged enough. Still, the longest conversation I had with her was on the day of my college graduation. She swanned into town, chucked a pearl bracelet across a restaurant table, and offered to pay for graduate school. She rescinded the offer after I mailed my applications. I don't know why. The bracelet I got to keep. Well, for a while, anyway. My efforts to repurpose her objects, to give them the soul they never had, have been slower than their financial appreciation. The necklace originally belonged to my great-grandmother, and apparently she was no picnic either. I have long suspected these objects of not wanting to be on me, the green ring sensing an unfamiliar pulse pass through it. My mother, the least favored child, was relegated to the footnotes of the will, so these items are my sole inheritance. But I have thought of them as cursed. I've never worn them on planes. And now a stranger is in my home, packing up the remnants of a cruel woman and carting them off. Unfortunately, they are worth quite a bit of money. Even I do not know how much. I've never had them appraised, which would have been necessary to get them insured. Maybe because appraisal always seemed too adult, like hiring a lawyer or buying a water pick. Maybe because I have felt about these things the way I felt about my grandmother, that it was not my job to look after them, but their job to look after me. The thief also steals my other grandmother's silver engagement band, a charm bracelet built for smaller wrists, and a cow-shaped pin I found in the gutter in Madison, Wisconsin. All I have been left and all I would leave are being dumped into a stranger's backpack. It's indulgent, though, to tell the story like this, in the present tense, as if I can still stop it, as if there's an ankle to be grabbed. There's no ankle. I can't stop what's already happened, but this is the only way I can explain the events of June 27, 2019, or the days that follow it. 30 days down to the hour that will be bookended by personal loss. 30 days down to the hour that I cannot know will be a precursor to a year of global loss. Eventually, I will look back on the burglary and see it for what it is, a dark gift of delineation. I know when my first bomb went off, not everyone gets to know. And no one is obliged to learn something from loss. This is a horrible thing we do to the newly stricken, encouraging them to remember the good times while they're still in the fetal position. It's like feeding steak to a baby. I have read the grief literature and the grief philosophy and, God help me, listen to the grief podcasts. And the most practical thing I have learned is the power of the present tense. The past is quicksand and the future is unknowable, but in the present, you get to float. Nothing is missing. Nothing is hypothetical. In truth, I am writing these words on the evening of August 27, 2019. It's a Tuesday. The Amazon is on fire. It's been two months since the burglary. And it's been one month since the violent death of my dearest friend. This occurred on the evening of, Ju of July 27, 2019. I will be editing these sentences much later, after several dozen 27ths have passed, when the gap between the past and the present is more of a chasm. By then, I will be able to control how I think of these absences. I will be able to proceed with a conversation without flinching when someone mentions the wrong movie or the wrong song. But right now, I am in denial that my friend is gone. I am, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, in denial that the jewelry is gone. Human beings are the only animals that experience denial. All creatures will try to survive under attack, under attack, will burrow when under siege, or limp through the forest. But they recognize trouble when it hits. Not one fish in the history of fish, having gotten its fins chewed off, needs another fish's perspective. I don't know, Tom, that looks pretty bad. <laughs> Denial is humankind's specialty, our handy little aversion. We're so allergic to our own mortality, we'll do anything to make it not so. Denial is also the weirdest stage of grief because it so closely mimics stupidity. But I can't be helped. It can't be helped. I am holding these losses as an ant might, as if they are familiar but not quite mine, as if they are books I will be allowed to return to some centralized sadness library. In the days immediately following the burglary, I am a tragic figure among my friends, but in a fun way. 
Something real has happened to me, but not to my body. I am not maimed or consigned to a fatal disease. I will live. Plus, I come bearing a mystery, one that can surely be solved right here, right now, over this shared appetizer. Amateur detectives, each friend is more convinced than the last that she will be the one to solve my case. The burglary is like a brain teaser, a proposition shot up from a pistol. We had a book like this in our house growing up, a pop philosophy bestseller called The Book of Questions. The only question I remember verbatim is this one. I'm gonna read it even though I do remember it verbatim. <laughs> you and someone you love deeply are placed in separate rooms with a button next to each of you. You each know that you will both be killed unless one of you presses your button in the next 60 minutes. You also know that the first to hit the button will save the other but immediately die. What would you do? Even if you give an answer to this question that will absolutely result in divorce, the wording prevents you from being too cocky about murder. What would you do, not what do you do? In the same way, people are drawn to the thought experiment of the burglary more than the burglary itself. Some point out that I have been the victim of a retro crime. Yes, I'm aware that the 1970s came back to kick me in the face. Out of kindness or curiosity, they demand a tour of the story, but they aren't having any fun on the tour. They adopt the expressions of nurses exchanging furtive glances about the drip. Fine then, I say, tell me what to do. They advise me to do nothing, to write nothing, only to get some sleep and maybe install an alarm system. They mean well, but what they do not understand is that if I do not capture what I have lost, it will be like losing it twice. At first, I insist there is no trauma. As a New Yorker, my threshold for a scarring experience involves being knocked unconscious and shoved into a barrel. I wasn't even home for this. But the trauma humps my leg like a dog. I pick at memory scabs, recalling the sound of the amber amulet sputtering along its chain. On the subway, I stare at other people's jewelry, necklaces on fleshy display stands. I run my thumb over the base of my pinky as if I, pu as if I push hard enough a ring will pop out. Am I too attached to these objects? Is this an ignoble level of attachment for a grown woman to have? One hour, one lousy hour. Oh, I already told you this, sorry. I'd gone to get a hand x-ray nearby, thus leaving the silver rings I wore every day for 20 years behind. And what is there to be said about this? Luck is a dirty word when you're out of it. There is no sign of forced entry when I return, though this is not something I generally scan for upon entering my apartment. But then I spot several of the ceramic drawers where I keep my jewelry smashed on the bedroom floor. My first thought is, earthquake? The cat has aged out of mayhem. Then I notice the rest of the drawers turned over on the bed and follow the trail to the open window. Most traumatic events prevent, present their size and shape fairly quickly but some unfurl slowly, like a fist loosening its grip. When I call 911, my voice is urgent, but searching. It's the voice of someone who has run onto the train as the doors are shutting. Is this the express? Have I gotten on the express? It has never before occurred to me that 911 operators must hear an eerie amount of calm, of people seeking confirmation that they should be calling at all. The operator is in the midst of sharing a joke with her colleague when she picks up, and she can't quite pull it together in time. She says, nine, ha ha, one, one, what's your emergency? So that's the beginning <laughs> of the book. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. So I read for a little longer than I normally do because part of the reason I only read a snippet is it gets funny. <laughs> um, uh, but that beginning part is, is not so, is not like a, a laugh riot. Um, and then it also weirdly simultaneously gets funny and becomes more and more about my friend. This is obviously territory that was about the, about the jewelry. But now we shall open it up to questions, comments, and criticisms. You mentioned that you worked in publishing yeah. before you became a writer. I'm curious as if, did you go into publishing saying, I'm going to become a writer that's going to make Don laugh out loud in the bed when he's reading my book. I or really hope you're Don. <laughs> <laughs> or 
was it at some point you're working in the publishing industry and you were just like, well, I can do this? Uh, well, thank you for the compliment embedded in that. Um, wait, do I have to repeat the question? No. <laughs> no. Everyone's like, no, don't. <laughs> don't repeat it. Just, um, so, no, it, 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 I would say they, it wasn't sort of organic, um, but it also didn't really, the streams didn't exactly cross. So basically, I'd always wanted to write. I had, you know, been all the, the sort of typical trappings as sort of editor of my high school literary magazine for my mother, who might be listening. Um, you know, and like in college was an English major. And then what happened is, um, well, I wanted a job because of money. <laughs> There's some Dorothy Parker quote that's like her least famous one, and yet I'm still going to butcher it, where she, someone asked her, why write? And she's like, for money, dear. Um, but uh, which sounds more charming and less careerist coming out of her mouth than, than mine. Um, but yeah, so I'd always wanted to do this, um, but really wanted to write fiction. And then one day, what happened when I was around 24, I was moving apartments and uh, you know, getting ready to move. It's a big deal to move anywhere in New York. It's especially big pain in the butt. And I um, shut the door to throw out like the first bag of trash. And I had that instant feeling when you know that doorknob is not opening. And you're like, mm, mm-hmm. And, and I had to call a locksmith. And I already was like breaking the bank with the movers. And then somehow, and this is not, um, this doesn't speak well of me um, per se, uh, but about eight hours later, when this was complete, I moved into the second apartment, went to throw out the first box, shut the door, and I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> and the same locksmith came, because it was the same neighborhood, and I had a doormat at the time that said deja vu frontwards and backwards. And he gestures with his pen, he goes, it's a funny doormat. And I'm like, okay. And so the, writing, the pieces I started writing for The Voice, for different places, started to have that lock-in quality where I'd hear some sort of line that threw something into sharp relief and realize that it was either comedic, had a larger point. Um, you know, this is about the stress of living in New York, not just boo-hoo, I locked myself out twice in you know, one day. And then um, I, the book sort of came as I had this day job in publishing. And to tell you the truth, now I'm just going on, sorry, this is so long, Don. But, the <laughs> but basically, it was very awkward for a long time because I was promoting other people's books and working on my own and taking my vacation to go on book tour, which again, I know small violins need to be uh, produced at this point, but it was just strange to call up the San Francisco Chronicle and say, would you like to cover this book of newly translated Icelandic short stories and then say, you know, well, we have room for one more book, you know, yours or his. And I'm like, okay, Sophie's Choice, this is not, no, 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 no. <laughs> and so I really was, it sort of became this thing that was very separate where I loved my career, but it's not why I got into it. That is a long answer involving a doormat. I make the next one shorter. <laughs> Hi, this is a very weird personal question. And you can opt not to answer it if you like. Leo. But yeah. when you're dating, in terms of sense of humor in the person that you're dating, do you hope to date someone as funny as you, funnier than you, or less funny than you, but that person ne needs to be able to laugh at your, your <laughs> jokes? What I, uh, the, um, <laughs> so the structure of the question is such that I cannot help but picture it as like a, like a form at a doctor's office. <laughs> Like, would you say you're in like a medium amount of pain, like a severe amount of pain? Do we need to like um, a little bit of itching, like a ton? Um, I I have never. I I think someone. I don't know why you would date someone who is less. I don't think I'm even friends with people who are less funny. But also, funny is not the uh, the only metric for other human beings. I think you know. I feel like. Um, if I have friends who are quite, you know, like like a human rights lawyer friend, who's maybe not like, ah, you know, but especially with the news, she's gotten much funnier. <laughs> but um, no, if I have someone like that, it's like a, they appreciate humor. So I just, I can't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe they're not like, uh, but you don't necessarily, I think nobody wants to be with someone who's doing bits all the time. And you don't need to be a sort of humorist or a stand-up comedian for that. You know, you know what that looks like. Yeah. I don't know if this is really a question, but this, I was like, is this personal? <laughs> no, it's not. AB positive. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, 
You're going to want to kill me. I can donate blood to everybody. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. Um, you made a quick mention in this book about your other book, The Clasp. Mm. And um, I don't know. Is there more to say about the connection yeah. between the two? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's, you guys are asking questions where you're after a while, you're like, oh, I got this. I know, like, I don't, I've never, I've not been asked any of these questions, um, except by another guy named Don. It's very strange. Um, but <laughs> no, no. Um, so I mentioned that part of the mystery, um, and again, this is, I, I sound like, I sound like um, it's such a weakened state to be like, I assure you, it gets funnier. Um, but uh, when the cops come to my house, which I call them to come there the night of the burglary, um, they're asking me, they're grilling me, you know, is there anyone you've had working in the house? You know, did you did you break up with someone because he wasn't funny enough and he retaliated? <laughs> you know, like they're, they're just like grilling me. Um, and I'm like, no, and my mind is, you know, a sort of a, a somewhere between a brush fire and just sort of like a frozen tundra. And I'm just like, I, I don't know. And, um, but I did say, I was like, well, <laughs> I published a novel, my first novel, which came out significantly about like five or six years before the burglary, is about a guy who steals a necklace and he does it by climbing into someone's bedroom. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to be weird <laughs> because it's like this weird mix and I think I've never gotten past um, the ego involved in that line of thinking, so I can't do it. Like, it's, it, it, like, even though it takes such ego to be a writer and put pen to paper and think you can create a world, even in a nonfiction sense, I can't, I can't quite do it. I don't think it did that well. I was like, are there enough copies in circulation for this to be a problem? And, um, you know, and I was like, I don't know, I feel like I don't think my publicist did that good a job. <laughs> like, where there's now people coming into my house. Um, so I just thought it was just sort of a wild, a wild coincidence. Um, as I was guessing, like, who might have, uh, you know, I don't want to ruin the book for you, but who might have, like, uh, done this crime. But I don't know. Uh, there's no other, like, leads as it relates to that, you know. I did actually in my, it was something that's not in the book, so I go, because, I, you know, after my friend dies, I become quite grief-addled. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this term of magical thinking um, from other books. Um, and part of the magical thinking is feeling like if I can solve the mystery, which these things don't really get solved normally, you know, of like who took it, where it went, what happened, um, that I could somehow get my friend back. Not in like hologram form, but just, you know, some, somehow I think that this is connected in my brain. And so the lengths I went to, there's more than what's in the book. Like as some, and to your question, at some point, a friend of mine who's a jewelry designer, like costume jewelry, had made a, um, a necklace based on the necklace in The Clasp, which is the novel in question. And I was like, do you have records? Can you tell who's been looking at your website? And is there someone who's been looking at that page? And she's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it sounded like the most sleuthy, sensible, I almost wanted to be rewarded for such a suggestion. I'm like, right? Isn't that smart? And she's like, no, <laughs> that's not smart at all. But so that's, I think that's the extent of what's not in the book about the, about the novel, yeah. i ask a quick question. Sure. And I'm sorry to go to the dark side. Oh no, it's actually good. It's, it's... Um, you talked about losing a friend. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of people have experienced death. How, how did you cope? You know, what type of coping skills did you learn and use because I don't know if you was using the coping skills while you were writing that book. You know, what what skills did you use? Because a lot of people, when they're grieving and they're doing writing books or they're making movies or they're doing something in their life, sometimes they can't cope and they put it off. But I just want to know what type of coping skills did you use to stay on task, to keep going? Because I, I, I want to congratulate you because some people, like I said, will leave, um, you know, writing a book or doing something and they'll wait 10, 20, 30 years and they'll come back, mm -hmm. you know, when they have got through grieving. But what type of coping skills did you use? I want to know. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, oh, none. Um, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, it's so funny, though, because you've used it the way you asked it. I, I keep thinking... 
every time you said coping skills, it became like more official in my brain. And I'm like, is there like a website for this? Like, like, like coping skills after grief? Because it sounds so lovely and definite. Bless you. Because it sounds so lovely and definite. And I feel like, um, so when it comes to, I guess there's two different ways I'll answer it. When it comes to the book, uh, I did not find it cathartic to write the book. I did not feel like the book helped me grieve. Um, I actually quote um, the Italian author Natalia Ginsberg in here where she says something like, you cannot hope to be um, soothed by your profession uh, from grieving. There's no, this is not a way out of it. Um, and I agree with her much more than I agree with, I've heard other authors say that they felt, found it so cathartic and so such a relief and so good to write sort of an elegy to their friend. And I do find that it feels good, but it is very detached from how I miss him and how sad I was and how consuming it is and how I do feel like I'm changed forever by what happened. I've never, I've known people who have died this way, but very tangentially, no one this, this close. Um, and I did feel, that's the last bit on that, is that like, to your point, you sort of were like inadvertently maybe sort of like getting at it, where when I stopped the book, I felt like, okay, now we can begin. Now, and I was worried. I was like, when I hand this in, I think I'm in trouble because I think it's all gonna come sort of flooding back. But I think one of the things is because of the nature, so I can only really answer for myself, because of the nature of my friend's death, which was suicide. Suicide has such, the problem is, is it will cannibalize everything that came before it the way other deaths will not. I've known people who've died, <laughs> but by, you know, let's say cancer, something like that. Um, I've known people who've died in an accident, but I don't, it doesn't then color, it doesn't like start like eating through the metal in reverse, which is this does. And so I think the thing that really helped me is to remember that how he died is not our entire friendship and it's not all of who he was. And there was a lot more to it than that. Um, and then in terms of just being sad, I, I think I just sort of let myself be hysterically sad. I think when you have a friend who dies, it's a little bit wonky if it's a very close friend because you feel like an imposter. You know, like I, he has a mother. I'm, I did not give birth to my friend. <laughs> um, I'm just imagining him here being like, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and he has a partner and he has, you had these, these other people in his life. So I think my biggest thing as the friend was to sort of as quickly as I can or could jettison the sort of inferiority complex, you know, or the, the, you know, feeling like I didn't really actually deserve to grieve as much as I was grieving. So if you're mourning a friend, I would say get rid of that part as soon as you can. Um, do you have any advice for writing about grief? Mm. Um, yeah, it's really hard because it's, um, I would say it's the most cliche topic I've ever tackled. Not the most cliche, that's unfair. Um, the most well-trodden you know, it's like, you know, wake up one day and you're like, wait till people hear about the Civil War. I'm gonna bl blow the doors off this, you know? Unless you come in through some weird way where it's like, this is my book about like Lincoln's haberdashery. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not gonna, so for me, I feel like I did need the container, um, the setting, if, if I may be so um, cheesy, uh, of the jewelry to tell the story, to have it have a sort of propuls propulsion and a comedy and a mystery to it because the balance is, is what you have lost feels so specific and it's the most universal thing <laughs> that it is. And so it's like, how do you then, which is like all well and good to say, but when you sit down to write, you're like, well, is it gonna sound like I've invented the wheel? You know what I mean? Or that I think I have. Um, and so I think that I was like careful to keep Russell as sort of my North Star when I was writing about my grief in general. So if I had an opportunity to share a story about him, to share a story about our friendship, to something that was sort of, again, as per the last question, that was really about his life and not just about his death, that sort of got me out of it. Because it's not like I'm writing a biography of him, but then it has this sort of joy to it. Um, which is, I think a lot of people have said this, is the, it's, it's a form of love, grief, you know? And so I think you tap into that part of it and then it just becomes easier and less like <laughs> you know um, what books are you reading right now oh this is a very good question 
Um, Vivian Gornick's essays um, are really easy and uh, digestible, and it's the kind of thing, actually, also for your question about like writing, I feel like if you want to write and have already tapped out on Annie Dillard or something like that, <laughs> um, uh, Vivian Gornick's essays, I'm rereading a book called Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. It's <laughs> um, it's by the problem is, is I'm not going to be able to pronounce the last name because it's it's very Polish. But she won the Nobel Olga. Um, this isn't being recorded. Great, <laughs> but um, it's it's brilliant. It's about a woman who um, lives uh, in sort of this remote uh, in the remote woods on the on the Czech border, and uh, mysterious things start happening uh, very violently to animals around her, and it's insane and beautiful and dark and funny. Um, and I had actually reviewed it at some point, but I have to, I have to reread it. Um, and then also for different reasons, um, I'm reading, because I have to, this is like for work purposes, but uh, Dorothy Parker's reviews, book reviews in The New Yorker. It's just, they're brutally funny. They're, it's in, and they're funny in a way that we don't talk about books uh, in that way anymore. And yes, yes, it's Dorothy Parker, but it's kind of incredible where it feels like her version of like warming everyone up and being nice is to just say like the title and the name of the book. She's like, I hated it. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's the answer. Um, I just had a question about um, reading through this book. Um, I was particularly interested in kind of like how you broke it up in like the stages of grief. So I guess I have like a two part question. The first is like in the anger stage. I know you like broke it into kind of like three smaller mm -hmm. sort of vignettes or stories. So I'm interested to see, like hear about why you did that or how you kind of talked about that. And then I noticed your very last section, instead of calling it acceptance, you called it afterward. I just was, you know, interested in what made you want to, you know, call your last stage, quote unquote, afterward instead of acceptance. So, yeah. This is such a, a good question, which makes it sound like I'm filibustering because I don't have the answer. Um, but the <laughs> thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, no, but really uh, only because it's, um, you know, my little sort of preamble when I got up here, I'm used to being in conversation and I hadn't prepared a speech and it's like, I'm going to forget some basic stuff. And this is like such a fundamental <laughs> question. So the book is basically loosely based around the five stages of grief. Also, they're switched. Um, so a sign of, someone told me very recently, uh, too recently, that uh, so way after the book, after we'd pressed print, um, that the five stages of grief were originally meant, you know, those Kubler-Ross, um, I almost called them Myers-Briggs, um, that the <laughs> those Kubler-Ross stages of grief uh, are meant for the dying person. Yeah, see, everyone knows this. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, well, that makes a ton of sense. Because I'm like, what do I have to bargain with or be angry about? Do you know, that's for them. <laughs> um, but so the reason why it's structured like that is in this sort of half giving credence to something that, you know, part of the difficulty as per the question about like writing about something that's like so heavy and grief and common, um, I was sort of disgusted by the stages of them and I'm such a little snob that I was like, well, that's not for me. And so part of it is like, yes, it is. <laughs> And it's, that's how it's structured. Um, and then I'll sort of work backwards. Afterward, um, I mean, I joked with my editor. I was like, I accept nothing. <laughs> Je accepte rien. <laughs> um, but it's also a book. So it's like a nod to the format of it itself. And then you asked about the middle section is broken up in the way it is to give it some structure because it had to build in a certain way and go back, and it's really the first departure. So the first two sections are kind of trucking along quite nicely, and then hopefully I've earned enough trust to be like, well, now we're gonna go back to something else. But so it's to give it some structure, and it's also the centerpiece. I like to put something good in the physical middle of the book. Like, you know what the middle of a book looks like. Um, but really the reason why it's even like this fundamentally is because of the second section. So the second section is bargaining. And I'm not saying it's effective, I'm not uh, trying to sort of toot my own horn here, but I am saying that I've never personally experienced as a writer such a lock-in or such a fit between a th the theme I was, the sort of spirit of something, uh, and the actual facts of the case and what was happening. So bargaining is the bargaining stage of grief where I am convinced that, I can, that this didn't really happen, that somehow I can undo it at the same time I will say I did locate some of my missing jewelry. 
and I might have gone to the Diamond District to shake down some very nice gentlemen. So <laughs> it literally was bargaining at the same time. And so once I had that, I realized how everything else sort of fell into place with denial. There's a COVID section, don't worry, there's not too much hand sanitizer, It'll be, you'll be fine. Um, I think everyone doesn't want to, I almost feel more compelled to warn people about COVID than, than the suicide at this point in terms of what people truly do not want to engage with or read about. I've been very impressed by how much people are willing to engage with suicide, and, but still no to, to COVID. Um, but that's like depression. So it came like that. It's a long answer. Um, did he ever come back to you? Oh, uh, Russell? Yes. Um, you know, I was surprised that there are certain um, things I'm a little more attuned to than I wasn't before. My fundamental beliefs in what's real and what is not have not altered significantly. Um, so he never came back to me in any like real sense, but there are things that I've noticed even since the night before the book came out. I uh, was in a nail salon um, and it was late at night and it was closing up and there was this dog that was this like mangy dog, like missing teeth, so the tongue is like <laughs> um, that had a cone around its head. It was a sad, sad dog. <laughs> and I was trying to make conversation with the woman who lived there just because I mean, the woman who worked there excuse me because it was a little awkward and I was like I don't even know why I asked it's not like I heard him say the dog's name heard her say the dog's name I was like oh what's his name and she said it's Russell and I was like oh that's weird and I <laughs> pet the dog and the dog went <laughs> do, you know, and do I think that this is Russell coming back in the body of a, a 16 breeds at once dog <laughs> probably not but I do think that there's something that if you pay attention is like um, maybe overlaps on itself a little bit. Sorry. Give us a glimpse of you at your desk. Sweats, jeans, drink on your left, favorite snack on the right, time of day. Let us know the secret. <laughs> wow. I'm going to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, work at a, I work facing a... a wall a plain white wall um and there's like a window in the distance but i it's very punishing like if you saw it you'd be like are you in trouble in kindergarten why are you in the standing in the corner <laughs> and think about what you've done um which actually is not totally uncommon i think it's nice to get away to write sometimes i've done it myself you know or either on my own dime or at some sort of like residency um but I actually almost find them the intimidation of being in a beautiful space with a big oak desk, um, a little too writery. Um, and I know that I'm not alone in this. I have a, um, a couple friend who will remain nameless. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Um, they're both writers. One is much more uh, famous than the other. And the one who is more famous works in like basically the basement. And the one who is like, or not more famous, you know what I mean, but like more productive. And the other one works in like a glass encased, like redone, <laughs> beautiful place. It has like a fire fireplace, but it's far away from enough, enough from the glass that it doesn't break it, and it's tiled, and there's bookshelves, and I'm like, oh, that's that's funny. So, but it's it, but it's not. I mean, maybe that's about their relationship, and I shouldn't be saying any of this, but <laughs> but like, but I think it's I think it's actually really about what the other needs, do you know? Um, and I I think um, not to to put myself in the ring with that person, but just to simply say that I think especially when you write humor or anything like that, it's very important to, to pretend consistently, almost like no one's going to read it, um, that you're just at your kitchen table doing it, just specifically for humor, I think. Um, but what do I eat? I, just, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I can rotate around, so I unfortunately have a chair that can rotate and, and open the fridge like this. So it's not, it's not great. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that people are always asking about writers' habits. Um, there's a great, someone, I think Balzac had 50 cups of coffee a day, which is hilarious. <laughs> like on 34, he's like, I'm almost there. Like it's, like, it's like, it's like, this is good. This is not enough. But like, so, but I don't really know if there's like a key to, to unlock it except regularity. So whatever you do, do it all the time. And if that's to stay up and have 52 cups of coffee, presumably punch a hole in your stomach and stay up until like 6 a.m., bless you. 
<laughs> it worked for him. So, yeah. Um, so you write about June 27th and July 27th, and you start writing on August 27th. Yes. When you started, did you recognize that you were going into writing for a book and that it would mm. still hold your humor as it does? Um, well, the humor, so there's sort of two questions in that. That's interesting. So, no, I didn't think it would be a book. I think the burglary started. The burglary, I was taking notes for the burglary, and I've always approached essays with this feeling of desperately not wanting to merely confess or merely complain and trying to find the bullet points or the, you know, the bullet points beneath or the umbrella sort of above of uh, some sort of thematic topic. And even with a felony, <laughs> I was like, eh. <laughs> you know, it's still not like, what is that? That's just the thing that happened. Um, so I was sort of on the hunt for making it, I thought, like a longer essay. I didn't think it was going to be a book. And then, unfortunately, I got the bullet points of my life, you know. Um, and the rest of it's trying to solve the mystery of, of Russell um, and what we lose. Um, but I didn't, there was another question in that. I'm sorry. There was like another, something about the, I lost the train. Oh, the humor. So the humor is, um, <laughs> uh, the humor is how I talk. It's, it's, it's not, um, if anything, it's, it's, uh, it can be kind of annoying <laughs> to my editor only. <laughs> but, it, you know, where it's, it's like too many, um, like, simple bashing monkeys per square inch, you know, or he's like, eno like, enough. Because it actually starts to sort of obscure the point of what you're trying to say if you're that afraid of just, like, making things either plain or making them beautiful or, you know, or, or making them philosophical. Um, so I knew that, that my concern was more making sure I wrestled with and was honest about those things and wasn't just like the sort of court jester when it came to this. That's, that was more the difficulty. Okay. Um, I didn't want to ask this question, but you gave the spoiler that you got some of your jewelry back. Oh, yeah. Jewelry back I know. Um, I never know how to do that. <laughs> no, I think it's awesome. But is, you're wearing it, right? Or the <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, this. Okay, awesome. This I took a little trip. Yeah, I noticed it right away. Yeah. Um, but I was curious if your relationship to those objects changed mm. after they went on their journey and you got them back. Oh man, that is a that is actually a weirdly big question because so much about the reason why the jewelry is a precursor to, to Russell dying and why it fit together so well is because he was present for so much of either the acquisition of the jewelry or things that have to do with it. He's a bit of a hoarder, a bit of a collector, but mostly he just loved objects. Like I have a bit in the book where I was, would say that, you know, it wasn't enough for you to just say like, to hold the flamingo shaped crazy ashtray from the 60s that he had bought at the flea market you had to agree on how wonderful it was <laughs> or he'd like snatch it back from you <laughs> you don't get to hold it and I'm like okay I don't want to um but <laughs> but uh so I feel like I have there's like I'm not I'm not going to take this ring off and and trash it like like whoops <laughs> like the old lady at the end of Titanic you know um or Britney Spears, um, but like I'm not. But at the same time, it, it has sort of actually, it is an interesting litmus test for practicing what you preach in the book, where something so much bigger happened and the importance of it. It's not like I didn't know the importance of human life before this, but there's something about it where it's been sort of defanged a little bit from being that important. I'm a grief counselor. Oh, hi. We both same. are. Oh, okay. Here we go. And um, <laughs> one thing that. I've run into that I'm curious if you've experienced is there's this term called disenfranchised grief, uh, which often comes up for folks that have lost friends. Yeah. And I'm curious if over the journey of your writing, um, I'm imagining that you struggled with it maybe internally of like, is, am I like related to this person? Is, is, am yeah. I able to write about this versus like if other people have, you know, given you that kind of um, ignorant feedback <laughs> over the course of the book? Um, so yeah, over the course, no one, no one really like tried to t said like you don't get to be sad. Nobody said that. Yeah, <laughs> you're like that's step one. Well, because I do read. There's a there's a little bit of the book where I read some um, self help books that are sent to me where I'm like I'm not reading any of these and they all got read. <laughs> um, and 
I think I was reading the wrong ones or something, but it was a, uh, <laughs> they were, I found them sort of like pat and distancing and the chapters are like loss of a spouse, loss of a parent, loss of an adult parent, loss of, I'm like, jeez, <laughs> like, you know, loss of a spouse, you don't like that much. <laughs> I'm like, this is so much, but where is the one relationship that we all have? Where is it? And, and I think that especially, and I, you know, we used to, I think in uh, events like this, probably in spaces like this, you know, I'm sure you guys have been to panels where like when in doubt people used to be like, well, you know, now with the advent of the internet, and now I feel like the version of that is like, well, now with COVID. Like, you know, and so, but it's hard not to be cliche about where it's exacerbated people's, I think, found family, people feeling distant from people, people feeling like they really have to create the world for themselves anew. Um, and so I feel like this is a book, is sort of a cry that, to say that like, actually this person meant as much to me as if he was my husband or my father or my brother, and that's fine. And that's like part of the point of the, of the book. And because also, I don't know, maybe I should turn this around and ask you guys, what's your relationship like with your parents? Like, <laughs> it's like, it's not all, you know, automatically, I mean, there's a different kind of grief, of course, if you have a parent died, that's a, an untethering in the world that's very different from this. But um, part of my thing was to just sort of ignore there were a couple of things I ignored while I was writing the book that I knew were out there and one of them is that there's not enough about friendship the other big one is the stigma of suicide like that just people saying I had an early interview with someone who meant well I think but I really thought okay I'm now gonna have to talk about my dead friend on tour I physically rolled up my sleeves for like a zoom and the first question she goes did you ever consider saying he died in a different way than suicide and I tried to make her sort of feel better with a joke or make it go away. And I was like, well, <laughs> falling piano kind of sucks the suspense out of the entire thing. Um, and she's sort of like morbid, you know, macabre joke. And she kept on, she kept at it. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what you're asking. And I was like, oh, you think that there is a stigma that I'm not protecting him by saying how he died. And I'm like, I disagree. But so those are the two things that like, do I have a right as a friend? And should I talk about suicide that I was like, F it. So you talk uh, in your book, you talk about things that people did and said to you that weren't very effective or weren't comforting at all. Yeah. If you could only talk about one takeaway from your experience about what you do differently now oh. when you are dealing with someone who's in the throes of grief. Mm. Uh, I don't wait until I'm dealing with someone who's in the throes of grief. I think that there's a way, while still retaining your humor and being casual and not dramatic, you should assume that everyone you meet is grieving. You should assume that you don't know <laughs> what the hell is going on with them. <laughs> um, but I think that when I've had people who've suffered losses before, I just think it's not that hard. I think it's just like you literally you just speak with something authentic and if it comes out as the same old I'm so sorry for your loss that's fine I think people will hear it if you're like I'm so sorry I wish I had known that person I'm truly so sorry um, I'm gonna check in in a week not let me if there, let me know if there's anything I can do it's like okay well now that's a chore for them <laughs> so that's not what they need <laughs> you know so I think something but I mean the curiosity about what happened the the thing that I reacted or bristled against in my book was people just sort of knee-jerk being like like, oh, did you know? And I'm like, I think that that question can, if it comes with, hey, I am worried about people in my own life. I would like to, you know, get some use out of this, out of this, like squeeze this towel and see if I can't get something to take back to my own life. I think that's, we should, that's why we should talk about suicide more. I think it's the heart of the thing. But the way I think that a lot of people ask is a little bit like, they're this close to being like, how do you do it, who found him? It's like a, it's a rubbernecking thing. So I just always find declarative statements now are helpful. If I'm not like, oh, did you know how long had it been? I'm like, I am so sorry I didn't know your friend. They sound wonderful. And it seems to, it's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, thank you. Oh, is that, I'm not, no, I can sign books though. I'm allowed. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming and asking such wonderful questions. So nice.